In the land of mesquite and sage near the White Mountains lives the remnant of the once powerful tribe called the Apache. It's a far cry from the wild riding warriors of Chief Geronimo, whose very name struck terror in the hearts of the early pioneer, to the present day life of the average Apache. We find them living in a semi-modern and semi-primitive state, clinging to some of their old ways and customs, but gradually giving in to the ever-pressing influence of the white man. Throughout the years, their home has not changed much. They still use poles, brush, and yucca leaves to make this humble dwelling called a wickiup. The Apache woman is complete mistress of her own home, doing all the work and preparing meals. Many of their dishes are made of corn, flour, and water prepared in different ways. Sometimes the whole kernel is used, and other times only the cornmeal, which is ground by hand. She always finds time, however, to work on the bead loom, from which she produces the artistic headbands they wear. The water is carried in those baskets you see outside the wickiup, and of course they are made waterproof. The campsite was usually chosen by the medicine man of the tribe, and it was said that he always chose it as far away from the water as possible, so that the women would be kept busy. However, this is merely legend, and may only be the grumbling of a tired woman. These legends, which have given us so much information about the former occupants of our land, were always handed down by the maternal grandmother. And, as one Apache so nicely put it, you white people have written books, but everything we know about our people is written in our heads. We have a difference of opinion as to whether the Apache woman ever ate with her husband. It was customary, when he brought friends home for a meal, that the men should be served first. And after they had eaten their fill, the wife ate what was left. We know that because of shyness, the Apache woman did not like to eat before strangers. And some observers say that she ate with her husband only when they were alone. While others say she always served her husband first and then ate her meal. Children were as welcome as rain to the Indians, and they had no preference as to boys or girls. The Apache girl always brought her husband home to her own clan, and they built their wickiup very near her mother's. While it was considered bad luck to speak to your mother-in-law, or even look at her, and much time was spent in dodging her, a husband worked for his wife's parents. So if one had many daughters, one also had many sons-in-law, who helped provide the necessities. The cradle board is still used today as the Indian has found no better way of carrying an infant. Laced snugly in, a baby can be carried on the mother's back as she works, or can be hung on a tree, or even suspended from a saddle horn as the father rides. Special charms and trinkets are hung from the wicker piece over the head, and all have different meanings. Some are believed to make the child a good hunter, another a good wife and so on. It is interesting to note that the babies cried very little as Indians trained their babies from infancy to lie still and not cry. This was almost a necessity as crying would reveal their whereabouts to an enemy or an animal. The Apache woman, in addition to her housework, tends to the crops. She could have her older children help her, but after a boy reaches young manhood, he will do nothing pertaining to women's work for fear of being teased by the other boys and girls. The Apache has always been noted for his horsemanship. In the early days, life itself depended on how well one could ride, shoot an arrow, and outwit the enemy. For this reason, a boy was instructed in the ways of warfare and hunting 
almost from infancy. Even today, the Apache devotes his time to herding and riding. Ordinarily, the Apache stays within his own community, but when there is a roundup, more help is needed, and the men from different communities gather together and thoroughly enjoy the rodeo which follows. There is great rivalry in sports, and to win an event over another of a different community brings a great personal satisfaction. Perhaps it is the spirit of the training of their ancestors which prompts them to take such pride in the exhibition of good riding and skill in roping animals. Puberty dance of the Indian maiden, or the coming out party as we would call it, is one of their most elaborate affairs. The dance starts at dawn, and after gifts have been carried to the lodge of the maiden, she makes her appearance with an attendant arrayed in her very best. She and her relatives have been very busy making preparations, and the results are most gratifying. From the eagle feather in her hair to the tips of her toes, she is obviously dressed up. The local population has been looking forward to the feasting, drinking, dancing and singing. It is supposed to bring good luck to all the community. And all seem very happy to participate. <laughs> During the dance, the maiden runs to the east around a basket of corn and back again to her original position. The little girls and boys following her symbolize that she will be strong and active, beloved by her children who will always follow her. Later in the dance, she is joined by her sponsor, an older woman chosen because of her excellent character. The Apache combined the puberty dance with the dance of the gods, or spirit dance, sometimes called the devil dance. Unheralded, the impersonators of the five deities enter the dance from the east. As this whole occasion is a sun ceremony, the east evidently is given special favor. The god of the east enters first, followed by the god of the south, the west, and then the god of the north. And we cannot forget the fun maker who brings up the rear. They carry two sticks, and the zigzag effects on them represent lightning. According to the parents' wealth and position does the dance proceed. And if they can afford it, the dance continues for four days. We leave them dancing by firelight, this once wild, roving people, whose deeds spread as a great conflagration over the southwest. And the spirit of their forefathers shines again like a small flame 
in a revival of their ceremonies. Oh, <laughs> 